right. No, oh, praise the Lord. All right, glorious, glorious. That was wonderful. O come, O come, Emmanuel, God with us. That's the season, that's the, that's the, the prophecy, that's the fulfillment of the prophecy that God came and he is with us. That's one of the great things about our God. Um, I know I've said this to you before, but there, uh, there's a great deal of difference between uh, Jehovah God and all of the other religious uh, people that are mentioned by uh, other belief systems all over the world. Um, and, and that is that of all the belief systems in the world, Christianity is the only system where our God is a personal God, where he is a loving God and a gracious God and a, an involved God into our life. And he offers us forgiveness and life. All the other gods are either absent uh, are so multied that they don't even uh, appear anywhere or they have to be appeased, they have to be sacrificed to in order to keep them from destroying uh, the adherence of, of that belief system, whatever it is. We know that all that's false, but still there are people that believe things like that. But our God is Emmanuel, God with us. He is. All right, let me, we're talking about... Uh, a series of transforming our mind. Uh, this might be the last message in this series. I, we, we've done four of them, and uh, I've covered fear, worry, anxiety, attitude, uh, how God goes about transforming your mind, and today we're looking at insecurity. Now, I'd like to say this at the start as a general instruction about, about some of the things that I'll say because I don't want to have to say this every time I say one of those things, <laughs> you know. Uh, toward especially some of these, uh, some of the, the, the ways to deal with insecurity, uh, I'm going to, to talk about uh, accepting these things in our life. Now, I, I want you to, this is, the, this is the disclaimer I want to give you to start with. An insecurity is just simply an anxiety or, um, or a, or a uh, uh, thought that somehow you, are, you, you don't meet uh, uh, expectations. Uh, it, it, it's, it's something that you have. It could be a physical defect. It could be something you don't like about yourself, like your nose or your ears or your hair or whatever it might be. Uh, it could be something you think about yourself, about the fact that you don't think well or you're not quick-minded or you know, you're not as uh, sharp as everybody else or you have certain limitations. These are insecurities. Insecurities are not sins. So when I talk about accepting these things and dealing with them uh, in certain ways, don't think of an insecurity as a sin. Sins, we all have sin in our life, and sin is a transgression of, of God, and we bring our sins to, to, to God and repent and receive forgiveness of our sins. So when you hear me talk about uh, accepting some things about yourself and so forth, uh, I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about these anxiety-producing uh, insecurities in our life that hinder us uh, and, and how we can deal with these things, how God tells us to deal with these things. So don't be thinking sin when I'm talking about something to do with an insecurity, all right? And the insecurity is just an emotional thing. It's a mental thing. It's not sin in your life, all right? Okay, so just kind of clarify that. So don't be thinking that when I come to it along the way, all right? All right, all right, good. All right, so we know that we, our mind has to change because uh, we're not born with the mind of Christ. None of us are born saved. So none of us have the mind of Christ before we come to Christ. So we know our mind has to change because it doesn't think like Christ. It thinks like the world because that's where we live. That's the, the influence on our life. We were, we we're born sinners, we choose to be sinners, and we sin, and we involve ourselves with the world. And before we come to Christ, we have a worldly way of thinking and living and dealing with life. 
So our, when we come to Christ, we know our mind has to change. So how does our mind change? Well, according to the Apostle Paul, in Romans chapter 12, he gives us two verses that are the keystone to a, a changed mind. And it's very simple what the Apostle Paul has to say. And this is the verse that we've kind of used as a, as a starting place in every one of these messages because uh, our mind has to be transformed. Let me just read Romans 12, verse one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So Paul says, if you're gonna give your body to God as a living sacrifice to him, you can't think like the world thinks. You're gonna to have to change the way you think. You are going to have to develop a new way of thinking. And one of the things that you'll see today is, is why this is so. You can't think like the world and present yourself to God and, and be what God created you to be because if, you don't, if your mind doesn't change, it's not going to let you be the kind of person that you have to be for God to work through your life. Maybe that'll make sense in a minute. So I have to be, be transformed in my mind and... Uh, how does that happen? Well, it happens through a complete change process, not, not just a, a reflection of a little different thought in life or a little uh, different attitude of life. No, it is a total transformation. The word that is used here for transform is metamorpho, metamorpho from which we get our English word metamorphosis, and I've said this a bunch of times, but a metamorphosis is a complete change. It is what happens to a caterpillar that turns to a butterfly. You can't even recognize, you, when you see a butterfly, you could not recognize that that at one time had been a caterpillar. I mean, it's just, to, everything about it's changed. Physical, uh, uh, function, uh, environment, I mean, everything. Everything totally changed in that. That's what transformation means. And so our mind has to be transformed. So let's talk about insecurity and what's going on with it. There, there, uh, I'm gonna present to you two truths about insecurity. Here's the first one. First truth about insecurity is everyone is insecure about something. Uh, all of us, all of us are insecure about something in life and we all have to deal with insecurities. Some people are very open about their insecurities while some other people try to mask their insecurities but the fact is, whether you try to cover it up or whether you just say, hey, I've got this and this bothers me and I'm dealing with it best I can, uh, no matter which way you try to deal with that, uh, the fact is that we all have insecurities. Here's the second truth about insecurities. Insecurity is an open door for either God or the devil to operate in our lives. Let me, I mean, I know it's on the screen, but let me just say that one more time. Insecurity is an open door for either God or the devil to operate in our lives. We make the choice about this. We were created by God to depend on him. Uh, the Bible continually calls us, Old Testament and New Testament, the Bible continually says that we are like sheep. Now, if you know anything about sheep, you know that sheep are completely dependent upon the, the shepherd. Sheep are defenseless. Sheep cannot carry heavy loads. You never heard of a pack sheep, you know? You never heard of a, of a ninja sheep. I mean, they, they don't fight well. They don't carry heavy loads. They don't even know where they're going. You know, you've never heard of, you know, like a, 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 a what would we call it? Um, anyway, they don't know where they're going. <laughs> I was trying to think of, of the word that's used for something that tracks a tracking sheep. Anyway, uh, you get the point. Uh, uh, do what? No. Did you? A GPS. A GPS. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they need one. But anyway, so, so uh, when I realize that I'm defenseless now, then I can yield to my shepherd and allow God to operate in my life or I can misplace my security 
and I can turn my security over to money or people or influence or popularity to try to fix me and, 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 and make me okay. So I can pretend to be confident, you know. I can uh, have dysfunctional relationships. I can uh, give myself to addictive compulsive behaviors to try to handle my insecurity. It doesn't matter which one I choose because the devil loves all of those kind of things in life. So I either can recognize myself as the sheep I am and him as the shepherd he is, or I can try to cover my own insecurities with all of these uh, ways of solving uh, my anxieties and my stresses about what I'm not. So there are two kinds of insecure people in this world. There are people who with acceptance and humility admit their insecurity and give their insecurity to, to God and say, you know, I just can't handle this. God, you're gonna have to do something about this and I have this real issue going on in life and, and give themselves to the Lord and seek their security in Christ. Or there are people who are deceived and think that they can be a secure apart from God. I'm saying that if, if anyone thinks that they can have security in their life apart from God, they are deceived. You can have no security in life apart from God because he is the one who gives us security in life. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here's what Psalm 91 has to say about this. Good word right here in Psalm 91. This is a good word for any time, but this is really a great word if you have, an, if you have any uh, issues in life. Man, troublesome times, this is a good word from the Lord. Beginning at verse one, Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. I like the way that starts. I think I put the scripture in, yes I did. Uh, I know the first thing I ask when it says, he who dwells in the secret place of God. Where is the secret place? <laughs> I mean, you know, if I'm gonna dwell there, he's gonna do some good stuff that we're about to read. All right, where is the secret place? Well, Jesus tells us where the secret place is. Matthew 6, 6, here's what Jesus said. But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So the secret place is prayer. When I'm in prayer with God, I am in the secret place with God. So here's what he's saying. He who dwells in prayer with God, he who dwells in the secret place with God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That, that's beautiful poetic writing, isn't it? I will say to the Lord, now this is a confession that, I, that we say to the Lord. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you, oh, this is, this is a beautiful, what would, an, an analogy, this is, he shall cover you with his feathers, have you ever thought about God with feathers? <laughs> you know, this, this just really alludes to a, a mother hen. You know, Jesus said that when he came into the city of Jerusalem and he was crying. Uh, he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you under my wings as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. You wouldn't have let me do this. And so it's just a picture of God bringing you in like a mother hen does her chicks when there's danger to protect you. And oh, so... Uh, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that walks in darkness nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, and I'm gonna skip that little line in the middle, I'll read it, but if you, if you get a little confused by that little inner line, uh, let's see, you have, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, 
skip the middle, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. That's what he's saying. Because you've chosen to, to dwell in God. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. That's where the devil got the idea of telling Jesus, throw yourself off the temple. The angels won't even let you dash your foot against a stone. Yeah, that's where it came from. Verse, verse 13. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent shall, uh, you shall trample underfoot. Now, this is now God speaking. So that was us saying this to God. Now, you, you, know, you are my refuge. You are my, my hiding place. You, I trust you. I put myself in, 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 in your hands. Now, this is what God says back. Because he has set his love on you. Uh, this is us. Notice a little he, not a little h, not a big h. So that's talking about us. Because he has set his love upon me. That's God saying, you've set your love on me. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I'll answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So this is a wonderful scripture to cling to now when you have any trouble going on in your life. And what the psalmist is saying here is, he's saying, if 10,000, if 1,000 people fall at my feet and 10,000 fall at my right hand, no trouble is gonna come near me because uh, I shall, I'm trusting in the Lord and the Lord's going to take this trouble away from my life. So all of the attention here, notice, is not on the mayhem and the disasters that surround him. All the emphasis here is on God placing his confidence in God and allowing God to deliver him. So it says, so we say, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him I'll trust. So he who dwells in the secret place, he who dwells in prayer with God will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And by the way, under the shadow of the Almighty is where all the good things happen in life. And he says, if you'll trust me and put your confidence in me, you're going to abide in my shadow. So this is something that I can say daily to the Lord. You are my refuge. You are, you are, you are my hiding place. So I can say that to God every day or when I'm feeling insecure or for, when I'm feeling fearful in life. Uh, God, you are my refuge. So it's a place where I can go to him. Me personally, I personally say, Lord, I... Uh, you are my refuge and, and, and you're my fortress. You're my God and I'm trusting in you. And when I make that statement, here's what God says again, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I'll deliver him and I'll set him on high because he's known my name. So here's what God's looking for. God's looking for someone who will admit the fact that they are a sheep and trust him to be their shepherd. He's not looking for you to protect yourself. He's not looking for you to defend yourself or do anything for yourself. Just come to him, abide in the shadow of his wings. All of his promises are made to those who know him and trust him and know that they can't defend themselves. They can't do anything for themselves and they have to trust him. So if you think that you can be secure without God, you are deceived because the only resolution of insecurity is in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you feel, in, if you don't have Christ in your life, and I know I'm talking to the choir, but if you don't have Christ in your life and you feel insecure, that is just a sign of, um, of intelligence because without Christ, you shouldn't feel secure. <laughs> There's no reason for you to be secu feel secure and you are not secure without Christ. So let me talk about a character in the Bible that shows us, uh, th this person is probably the most insecure person in the whole word of God. And of course, some of you Bible scholars already know who I'm talking about, right? Who would that be? Um, all right, it's King Saul. King Saul, Israel's first king. Now, this might, you might find this to be interesting uh, because 
government is something that's just gone haywire nowadays. Did you know that God, the only government that God created was in the Garden of Eden when he created Adam and Eve and put them together as a couple. And he said to them, I'm giving you the authority to take dominion over all of creation, over the birds that fly, the animals on the earth, the fish that swim in the sea. You take dominion, you dominate them, and you control all of those things. And so the only government that God ever established was a married couple uh, who um, gave him the authority of their life. So they, they ruled under the authority of God. And God has never changed that. When God established Israel, you know, the covenant with Abraham, and he said, this is, you do this, and I'm gonna do this, and so forth. You know, God never established a government for Israel. God didn't give them a king. They, they wanted a king, and they wanted to be ruled over, like all the rest of the nations around them. But God said, no, I want to be your king. I mean, I, I, here's what I want. I want you to submit yourself to me and let me be your king. But they weren't satisfied with that. They said, no, no, we, we want a king like all the other nations of the, uh, uh, around us. And so Samuel, the prophet, went to God for Israel and he was all torn up about this. Samuel was just beside himself and, and, and hurt and that, the, that, that, that the, the government of God would be rejected. And God had to say to Samuel, as a matter of fact, look, Samuel, don't, man, don't take it so personal. They're not rejecting you. <laughs> They're rejecting me. And so God said, all right, go back there and tell them if they want a king so bad, uh, elect them a king. And, and, and it's not gonna be good, but elect them a king. And so they went back, Samuel went back, told the people, okay, let's get us a king. So the people looked around and said, who could be king? Well, there was this guy that stood head and shoulders taller than anybody else in the whole kingdom. And they said, and his name was Saul. And they said, hey, because Saul's the biggest man in town, let's elect Saul to be king over us. And this is, is kind of funny. When they, when they, the day they coronated Saul, uh, they, Saul wasn't there. They had to go find Saul. And where was Saul? Saul was hiding behind the, the Bible says, behind the baggage. In other words, Saul was so afraid and so insecure about being king of Israel that he didn't even show up for his own coronation. He went and hid himself, and they had to go around trying to find him and finally found him behind the baggage and took him out in order to make him king. So Saul was a pretty good king to start with, and it started out all right, but over a period of time, uh, Saul just became a, a, very, uh, a very really demonic type person. A lot of things began to happen in his life, and, and so uh, God had to do something about it, and God sent Samuel to anoint a little boy at his home named David to be the king of Israel one day. He was just a little boy, and so here is Saul, and he's, as king, he's the commander of the army, and his army is out fighting the Philistines, and every day, the champion of the Philistines would come down and challenge the champion of Israel. Now, who should have been the champion of Israel? Saul should have been the champion of Israel. He's the biggest man in the kingdom. And so he should be out there taking the challenge of Goliath, but instead of being on the battlefield, Saul's back at the palace. He's not even out there. And so Jesse sends David one day with some snacks for his brothers. They're on the battlefield. He says, here, son, go take these uh, chips up there and see how your boys are doing. And uh, see how our boys are doing. Bring me back word. So David goes up there. He's just a boy now. He just goes up there and, uh, and he just happens to be there when Goliath comes out and makes his daily charge, you know, um, against the champion of Israel and called them cowards. And they're, you know, he's just trying to spark somebody to come out there and fight against him. And David happens to hear it. And, and David looks around and he sees all the guys, you know, they're just sitting there and they're kind of scared. And, all. and David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of God? 
David said, man, I'll take him on. I'll get it. And so they, wait, they said, well, you got to go back and ask Saul permission. So we go back to talk to Saul. Saul says, you're too little. You can't do it. And David said, look, I killed a lion and I killed a bear. And, and who is this man that I, that I would fear him? The same God that empowered me to kill the bear and kill the lion, he'll empower me to kill this ungodly Philistine, this uncircumcised, which means a, a man who doesn't have a covenant with God. Circumcision was the sign of the covenant. David said, I'm, I have a covenant with God. He doesn't have a covenant with God. He ain't got a prayer. That's what David said. So David goes and he kills Goliath. Well, you know what happens people start saying, uh, saying, hey, you know, David, man, David is courageous. David is brave. David is, and where was Saul? You know, so they start, the women start singing this little tune. Start singing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. Saul has, you know. And so, of course, Saul hears this and in his jealousy and in his insecurity and in his anger and in his fear, um, he begins to try to kill David. For seven years, Saul hunts David on the Judean hills. David is having to run for his life. But eventually, Saul is killed and his son in a battle, in the same battlefield, and David who had been anointed to be king as a child, now becomes the second king of Israel and Israel's greatest king. Now, in Saul, you find the seven signs of insecurity. We call it, I listed on your outline, the Saul spirit. It's the spirit of insecurity. And this is what the insecurity looks like in your life. This is what insecurity does in your life. Now, let me give you one little disclaimer. Remember, I'm not talking about sin. Sin goes to God, is confessed, repented of. God cleanses you and forgives you. So we're not talking about sin. We're talking about these insecurities that limit us and hinder us and keep us beat down so that we don't accomplish what God intends for us to be and to accomplish. And also, you're going to find as I list these seven that you probably have a shadow of every one of them in your life. And the reason why is because we all have to deal with insecurity about some things in life. So you're gonna see a shadow of probably every one of these in your life, but that doesn't mean that you have a Saul spirit. If you have them dominating your life and are a major part of your life and you, and you always demonstrate these things out of your life, then that would be a Saul spirit. But I want you to see, I'm using this because I'm not trying to, to cast some Saul spirit out of you in any way. I'm just wanting you to see what insecurity does. This is why it's important to hear what God has to say about how to deal with this. All right, number one, this is the first sign of a Saul spirit. You are unteachable and unapproachable. Insecurity keeps me from being approachable and keeps me from being teachable. I mean, you, you can see this, this sign in people's lives who can't even take the slightest amount of criticism. I mean, even a hint of any criticism or any questioning of them, man, they just blow up like a volcano or something. They just way overreact. So, and, and on top of that, some deeply insecure people, I, I feel, think that somehow uh, this is an admirable quality. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're so deceived and so, and so upside down in their thinking that they think that, hey, being like this is the way I want to be because I don't want people bothering me. I don't want anybody messing with me. I, nobody telling me what to do and all that. And so they, they're so deceived, they think that that's an admirable thing. They don't realize that all that kind of spirit does is keeps you immature because nobody can teach you anything. So you're going to be a baby your whole life and it's going to keep you isolated because nobody wants to be around somebody 
that could blow up in the next second for almost any reason in the world. So you stay isolated and you stay immature because nobody can tell you anything without you just overwhelmingly reacting to it. Uh, Proverbs 9, uh, look at what it says. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Wise people love correction. Wise people love instruction. Now, it doesn't mean that they always agree with it, but a wise person is a person who says, if I'm doing something wrong or I'm doing something that is unproductive in my life, I want somebody to tell me about it so I can stop wasting my time and my life doing things that are, that are hindering me in some way. But uh, it, uh, insecure people uh, don't. They are unteachable and unapproachable. Number two, sign, second sign. You are jealous and envious. Where does jealousy and envy come from? Well, it comes from insecurity. <laughs> If I'm jealous, you know, jealous, jealousy and envy are often talked about as if they're interchangeable, but they're not. They're two different things. Jealousy is when I'm insecure about something that belongs to me. Uh, the easiest one to see would be like my wife. All right, that's my wife. Well, if I feel like that I'm not man enough for her, I'm insecure about my manhood, about, my, uh, my, about her love for me. I'm always gonna be jealous around somebody that looks like they're trying to take her away from me because she belongs to me. I'm jealous about something that belongs to me. Envy is when you're insecure about something that belongs to others. When I see somebody with something and I say, man, I wish I had that. I, now, not just, we always say some little thing like that, but I'm talking about a deep, a deep attitude of your life and you'll do something to try to get it. You know, that's envy. Um, so envy and jealousy, they, they come from insecurity. So a person who has the soul spirit is gonna be uh, jealous and envious. Here's the third sign. You love to transfer blame. You don't, you don't take responsibility for anything. It's always somebody else's fault. It's never your problem, it's always somebody else. God said to Saul, I want you to go down and completely annihilate the Amalekites. They are wicked and evil and, and they don't need to be on this earth anymore and I want you to kill everything. The, I can't, the animals, the women, the children, everything. Don't just wipe them out. And so Saul goes down there and he does that somewhat. He brings Agag, the king, back, chained to a wagon, I guess to show what a great man he is. You know, he's insecure, so here's, here's Agag uh, being brought back to say, hey, I am, look at, I am really a good soldier. I am a strong, look, I got him chained to the wagon. And he also brings back the animals. And Samuel, the prophet, says to him, hey, Saul, did you do everything God said? And Saul says, yeah, man, I did everything God said. And Samuel says, well, what is that lowing of the cattle that I'm hearing and the bleeding of some sheep? And Saul said, oh, oh yeah, uh, I, I did bring the animals back because the people made me. The people said, you know, we may need to sacrifice to God somewhere before we get back. So we might better take some of these animals with us so we'll have some animals to sacrifice just in case God says, I want to sacrifice and I want it right now. So it was, a, so see, Saul said, it was either the people or it was God that caused this. It's not my problem. And so he just tried to transfer blame all the time and insecure people try to transfer, it's always someone else's fault. It's the government. It's my parents. You know, my mama didn't give me a pacifier when I was young and I became a serial killer. You know what I mean? But it's not my fault. My mama didn't raise me right or something. So anyway, this is the way an insecure uh, person feels about life. All right, here's number four. Fourth sign, you must always be in control. You're a control freak. I know that we have lots of control freaks here. 
uh, I might even be one myself. Uh, uh, I, but anyway, the point is, this is like you know a, a real control freak that just has to be in control of everything. Anything that Saul couldn't control, he tried to kill. Uh, insecurity drives you to try to control everyone and control everything around you because you feel more secure when you feel like you're under control and you feel better in life if you are the one that's under control, uh, that's in control. All right, number five, fifth sign. You're angry and emotionally insecure. In Saul's case, he ran along pretty good at first, but then uh, there was this spirit that came upon him at times. And now it was a demon spirit because it made him have fits and get out of control. I don't know what, it could have been epilepsy, it could have been uh, migraine headaches, it could have been, I mean, it could have been a lot of things. But what happened was when he had one of these things that came on him, he could not be uh, consoled. And so his his. His men said, hey, we got to do something to try to help Saul. So uh, is there anybody that plays music really good, like a harp, you know, real comforting? And one of the soldiers said, well, you know, I was down at uh, so-and-so uh, church last week, and there was this little kid that got on the stage, and boy, he could play a harp. He was unbelievable. I said, what was his name? Uh, David was his name. He's Jesse's boy. Yeah, that's one. He, was a, he was one of the youngest. He's the youngest son of Jesse. Go get him. So they bring David back to the palace and then David starts playing. When Saul goes in one of these fits, David starts playing on the harp and Saul is comforted by this and he settles down and everything becomes good. Well, uh, Saul was so jealous. Now remember the women are singing the little tune. Saul is so jealous and so envious and so angry and so emotionally insecure that he would pick up a javelin. Now get this, here's the guy that's playing the music, that's making you comfortable, and you pick up a javelin and you throw it at him, trying to pin him against the wall, trying to kill him. So you are angry and emotionally insecure. That is a sign of a Saul spirit. Here's the sixth sign. Your life is characterized by unbelief and spiritual compromise. Unbelief and spiritual compromise are a regular part of your life. This comes from Saul's incident with the witch of Endor. Um, this is a strange little thing that happened. Uh, uh, witchcraft was outlawed in Israel. Uh, by the way, Saul made that rule. He's the king, he made the rule. You can't, uh, witches and uh, incantations and all that kind of stuff, out. No, nobody, it's illegal in Israel. And Saul, Samuel the prophet dies. Well, Samuel was always the one that Saul went to to say, all right, we got a battle coming up with the Philistines. Do we need to go up there or we need to make them come down here or do we need to attack right now or do we need to wait till next week? Or because is God gonna be with us? That's what he was asking him. Hey, is Samuel, is God gonna go talk to God and find out if this is what God wants because if God's not with us, we're gonna get our britches torn off. So I don't want, we don't want that. So you talk to God and then you come back and tell us, tell me what it is God says. Well, Samuel dies. Well, now Saul has no one to talk to about this and get directions from. And so Saul, who made the rule, get it? Reminds me of some people nowadays who made the rule that you don't go to a witch now dresses up in a costume so that people won't recognize it's him I mean, sucker six eight or so. Everybody else is five three, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking, how do you think you're going to hide? You know, how do you, how do you think nobody's going to recognize you? You're a tree walking in their house. I mean, who is that? Uh, it's a tree. No, wait, that's Saul. <laughs> yeah. And so Saul, gets, Saul dresses up so nobody will recognize him. Goes out to Endor, which is a little town, Endor, and there's a witch there. And he goes into the witch and he says, I need you to contact Samuel and I need to talk to Samuel. So can you conjure him up and get him back here so I can talk to him? And she says, well, I'll see what I, do, I can do. And so she conjures and conjures and conjures. And finally, here Samuel's spirit appears. Now, we all know that it wasn't Samuel, right? All it was was a demon imitating Samuel 
to give Saul some bad information and deceive him. And that's exactly what happened. But the point being that here is Saul who is exhibiting total unbelief in his own spiritual laws and directions, and he's compromising everything that he says that he believes. So the spirit of insecurity leads to unbelief and a uh, compromise of spiritual issues. And here's the last one, seventh sign. By the way, don't raise your hand, but have you, do you have any of these? Anybody identify with it? Anybody besides me <laughs> identify with it? All right, here's the seventh sign. You have an inordinate desire to please others. Now, by, by pleasing others, I'm not talking about all of us really if, we're, if, we're, if we have any kind of compassion in our life or any kind of love, we want the people that we love to be happy. And so we want to please them in, in ways, some more than others and so forth. But I'm talk, this is a, an inordinate desire. This is like over the top. You just can't stand to disappoint anybody. And it just, you'll be in heaven and earth to just make sure nobody is unhappy with you. All right, Saul... Did, uh, did not obey God because he feared the displeasure of the people. You remember he said, I did it because the people made me do it, bring his stuff back. I didn't want them to get mad, so I had to do, I brought the stuff back. All right, now, Saul had a daughter by the name of Michal. Michal married David when he became king of Israel. She, she helped him, by the way, in lots of ways. She wasn't a totally bad person. But remember, she was brought up in the home of Saul, who was a people pleaser and wanted to make sure nobody was ever upset. So that's the environment that she was brought up in. So David, found they found the Ark of the Covenant out at a... a, a where the Philistines had left it with some milk cows, that whole story. So David said, we need to go out and get the ark, bring it into Jerusalem, ark of the covenant, bring it into Jerusalem so God can bless the whole nation. So, you know, they're carrying it and, they're in the, and it hits the, the, the pothole at the threshing floor and Uzzah tries to keep it from falling, boom, he's dead. Everybody runs away, they're scared of the ark. And uh, Obed-Edom said, hey, I'll take it. And, uh, <laughs> and it went down to Obi's house and Obi for, the, for six months, Obi was blessed, everything he did. His wife was prettier, his kids made A's in school. Um, his crops produced way more than everybody else's crop. When he needed rain, it rained on him. When it needed to be dry, it was dry. I mean, he was just completely blessed. And so David heard about it and said, man, we need to go get that thing from Obi's house because the whole nation of Israel needs to be blessed like that. So David goes out, gets it. This time they, they don't put it on a cart. They bring it right like they're supposed to because the, the, the scripture told them how to do it. And, and they did it right this time. And when they got to the city gate of Jerusalem, David strips off his kingly outer garment. So he must have had like, you know, some sports gear on underneath or something. Uh, so he strips his outer garment and he begins, goes in front of the ark and he begins to dance and act all foolish and gyrant, like a jester, like a clown. It, it symbolizing, by the way, that all men are fools before God. That's what that symbolizes. So God, Ark of the Covenant represented God, so David is acting like a foolish person, imitating how all men are fools before God. But, uh, and, and he's the king of Israel, and he's doing this, and all the people are watching him, and all of the, you know, they're going down the city street like a parade, and, and he's just doing all kind of foolish gyrations and flips and everything. And his wife, Michal, is looking out the window of the palace, and she sees him doing this. And so at the end of the day, when he comes home, she says to him, well, I hope you're happy with yourself. Do you realize what a foolish person you look like in the eyes of the people. The people were watching you do this and you just insulted, you just really diminished yourself today. And the kingship of Israel, you made a mockery of it today by doing what you did and all the people are gonna, gonna, gonna hate you for it. And David said, uh, I might look like a fool to you, but I didn't look like a fool to God. 
And he said, if you think that was foolish, I wasn't even ready to be foolish today. Next time, I'm going to be ready, and I'm going to even be more foolish <laughs> the next time than I was today. But the point is that Michal was trained in the home of Saul, who was nothing but a people pleaser. So her, uh, her uh, objection to David's uh, service of God was, you can't do that because... Think about what all the people are seeing you do. In other words, worry about what the people think about you more than you worry about what God thinks about you. So a Saul spirit is a very insecure spirit that wants to please people, an inordinate desire to please people. So those are the seven signs of insecurity. What is the root of insecurity? The root of insecurity is either an improper or a non-existent relationship with God. That's what causes insecurity. So when you're praying for somebody that's insecure or you have somebody in your life say, man, they got a soul spirit. I, I guarantee you that. <laughs> they got a soul spirit. That's all it could be. When you're praying for them, here's what you pray. You pray that they would know Jesus for real and that the root of this insecurity would be bound in Jesus' name and that God would reveal himself to that person. And that's what you pray for them. So let me give you three steps quickly now because uh, my time's running out. Um, it always is. But three, ste- three, three, three steps to daily victory because a battle with insecurity has to be fought every day. I mean, it, it's always there. It, it's, just, it's just part of life. So how are you gonna deal with this every day, these insecurities of life? All right, here, here, here it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, and I'm, I know you're familiar with this, but I'm going to read it so we can kind of jump in and, and see it real quick. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul says, he, he had this big, God took him up to heaven and showed him heaven, and, and God, uh, by, they, people stoned him to death is what happened at Lystra. They stoned him to death, and he, and, and he died, and, and he went to heaven, and, and, they, and Jesus showed him heaven. And Paul said, um, I really wanted to stay there. But God said, no, you got to go back. You got to go back. You, the people need you. you I got to send you back. And so he said, I saw stuff that I can't even tell you about. I saw stuff that's unbelievable. I saw stuff. It's illegal for me to say what I saw. So because he had that great event, there was an opportunity for pride and all of that to be in Paul's life. So here's what God did about it. Verse seven, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. In other words, God did something to me to cause me to trust him all the time and not get the big head because I had seen such spiritual things. So God did this to me so that I would trust him and not get too full of myself and not trust myself. All right, verse eight. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, Paul says, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in my reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. All right, what does that say? Here are the three daily things you have to do. Step number one, turn to God. Oh, I didn't say they were gonna be complicated now. Turn to God. Pastor, what? Turn, yeah, turn to God. Here's why I'm saying this. You, you do know, right, that God is personally responsible for some of the things you're insecure about, right? God, did you really mean to make, make my ears like this? I mean, God, were you distracted? You know, what, was somebody bothering you when you did it? You know, I look like Dumbo walking around here. Or my nose, God, did you really want to make my nose really look like that? Because it's just, it, it arrives five minutes before I do. Uh, you know, or God, why, why couldn't I have my beautiful lion's mane? I got old bald head. Uh, you know that God made you that way, right? 
That he did that on purpose. He made you the way you are. So some of the things that you might feel uh, uh, insecure about, God did it. And here's what I believe about this. I believe, this is just my personal belief now, I believe that God always does something to us that will make us need him. Because we need to need God. We don't operate good if we don't need God. Uh, you know, I've told you about my magic wand theory before. My magic wand theory is if I had a magic wand and I just passed it all, passed them to you, and that magic wand, you could just wave it over yourself, and anything that you didn't like about yourself, anything that you were displeased with, it would just fix everything that you were displeased with about yourself. That if you could do that, you would never seek God again because you wouldn't need him anymore because you would remove every reason that you seek God. Every weakness would be gone. Every vulnerability would be gone. Every frailty would be gone. Every disappointing uh, aspect of your life would be gone. Everything in life that makes you weaker would be gone and you would no longer need God. I suspect that's why we don't have any magic wands today because God wants us to need him. He creates us to need him. Him. It is in our best interest to need God and to go to God with all of our needs and seek Him. So, first thing you do every day, turn to God. All right, God, you made me like this. All right, I'm, this is the way I am because you made me this way. This is why I'm, I was telling you I'm not talking about sin. If you're a sinner, go to Him, get forgiveness. I'm, this is not about sin. This is about warts on you or something like that. He made you this way. And, and, and say, God, all right, you did it. Here's second step. Embrace your weakness. Embrace it. Paul's weakness was a thorn in the flesh, is what he said. So we're gonna have to assume that that means something physical because he didn't say it was a thorn in my spirit. He said it's a thorn in my flesh. So it, we, we think whatever that was, it was spiritual. I mean, it was physical and nobody knows what it was except we do get a little indication in the book of Galatians when the apostle says himself, he said to the Galatians, he said, you know, the last time I was here, I was here because I was uh, physically, I had a physical problem and I, I needed to stay with somebody. So I came down here and stayed with you and you guys were so compassionate that I believe if you could pluck your eyes out and give them to me that you would have done it. So it seems to indicate that his problem was probably uh, a vision, a sight, uh, maybe some kind of eye disease or something. But he, it, that's what he was saying. And he said, well, or whatever it was, we, uh, the one thing we know is that he hated it, whatever it was, because he prayed three times for God to remove it. And what did God say to him? God says, uh, I'm not gonna take it away. I'm just gonna tell you that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In weakness. <laughs> what's, what's the word now? <laughs> Weakness. So the weaknesses in your life are God's best opportunity to work in your life. The weakness that you have allows God to come into your life on a daily basis or a moment basis and minister in your life through not your strength, not through the things you like about yourself, but through your weaknesses in life, it opens the door for God to come into your life. But what if you hate your weaknesses? What if you won't bring your weaknesses to God? We naturally despise weakness. The world hates weakness. Every day we get bombarded with commercials that, that with messages like uh, be strong, uh, be rich, be smart, be beautiful, be anything, but don't be weak because the world hates weakness. But God doesn't hate weakness. God loves weakness because that gives God a way to work his power into your life. He said, my power is made perfect in your weakness. 
Why? Because that's where we know we need him. And so God does things in our life. Paul says, I'm, I'll gladly boast in that. So your mind has to be transformed in order for you to think like that. You're, unless your mind gets transformed, you will not accept your weaknesses as something positive in your life. It shows that your mind is transformed from the world's way of thinking when you can accept something about yourself that is a weakness and not only put up with it, but embrace it and say, God, you did this because this is your way to show yourself powerful in my life and for you to work in my life on a regular, regular basis. Because I'm disabled, I can't do anything about it. All I can do is live with it, I can't change it. Have, you, have any of you ever had anything you're disappointed in yourself? I mean, I'm talking about, well, maybe you don't like the way uh, your skin complexion is. You don't like the way your, uh, uh, you know, your body's shape. What, I mean, and you, and you try, try to change it and make it, you know. I mean, hey, look, all you have to do is look at uh, modern magazines or, or uh, uh, YouTube videos, whatever, and look at some of these crazy folks that have more money than sense and see what they did to themselves. They look like plastic freaks, you know. They think they look good, I guess, but that's what, I mean, this, your mind has to be changed for you to be able to accept yourself as you are and not try to fix stuff in your life. All right, let me give you the third one. Put your faith, all right, turn to God, embrace your weakness, put your faith in God's grace. What does that mean? It means we don't deserve it. We don't deserve God's presence. We don't deserve God's grace. We don't deserve God's love. We don't deserve anything from God. The only thing we deserve are two things, and I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, death and hell. Those are the two things we deserve. If we got what we deserved, we would get death and we would get hell. What, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wages are what you get paid for what you do. He says, what I ought to get paid for what I do? Death. And that's exactly true. So we have to trust the fact that we don't deserve it. It is not fair. It's grace. We don't get what we deserve. We get God's grace. What is grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. That's the old cross that we use. It's all free by grace. So Paul says, all you need is my grace. God says to Paul, all you need is my grace because my best work is done when you're the weakest. The world has preached at you since the day you were born that you must have it all together to be somebody in this world. I'm telling you the exact opposite. I'm saying to you that, that all you need to be is who God created you to be and made you to be and be secure in him because you can't change it. Oh, you can doll it up. You can put makeup on it, but you can't change it. The only thing we can do is learn to live with it and enjoy the rest of our lives. And insecurity is a sign of intelligence if you don't trust the Lord because you shouldn't be secure. All right, bow your head with me. Lord.